Thanks, Carl. I'm going to be talking about two different topics today. I'm going to be talking about upper plate response to flat slab subduction processes in southern Alaska. And what I'd like to do is give you an overview of a kind of a new model that's been developed by the tectonics community in Alaska the last 10 years, basically. And then I want to talk about outreach opportunities with native Alaskan communities. And 15% of the population in Alaska are, are native people, and there's 22 indigenous languages. So there's a rich culture up there that Earthscope has the potential to have a big impact on how they view Earth science, and that's going to be the second part of the talk. So some outline for the talk. I'm going to give you some just basic background information on what we think the driving mechanism is for flat slab subduction. Then we're going to look at upper plate processes above the flat slab region and upper plate processes around the flat slab perimeter. Just to give you some background information on the Yak attack terrain, it was first defined by George Plathker, and it's this area in blue here. Can everybody see that pointer? Okay. And in George's model, this train had been transported 600 kilometers along the Queen Charlotte Transform Fault and has been colliding into this corner, this tectonic corner of Alaska. Now, in the Plathker model, an important thing to remember in our discussion today is that everything kind of west of this line here, George had as oceanic crust that was being subducted, and subduction of that oceanic crust formed the Wrangell Volcanic Field, which is located here. East of that line, George had what he called continental crust. And as that crust has started to enter the subduction zone in George's model the last 10 million years, it's resulted in the uplift of the highest coastal mountain range in, North, in the world, basically, to Chugash and St. Elias. Now, a number of geophysical studies the last decade have shown kind of a different interpretation for the Yakutak slab, and it's shown in yellow here. And what's important here for our discussion today is that what these studies have shown, like the Bear Line, the Moose Line, some of the steep offshore data, that this crust of the Yakutak terrain is actually 15 to 30 kilometers thick. The entire unit that we call the Yakutak terrain or microplate. Some people suggest it might be an oceanic plateau. What's really neat is that, like at Mount McKinley, right there, you know. The geophysical studies have shown that the slab is only 150 kilometers beneath the surface. So there's this area of shallow subduction throughout southern Alaska that we hadn't recognized before. So where my research team comes into play is that we were interested in what is the upper plate record of flat slab subduction processes and how long have these processes been acting. And we're sedimentary geologists, we look at basins, we're looking at the record of deformation in the upper plate and the sedimentary response to that. You'll see this slide several times, I just want to point out a few things before we move on. So here's the unsubducted part of the Yakutak terrain that Plathker defined. And this dashed line shows the geophysically imaged part of the slab that's been subducted. And in this area over here, we have the Wrangell Volcanic Belt. We'll talk a lot about that. And these triangles are active volcanoes. And here we have the northern extension, sorry about that, of the Aleutians. So what we tried to do is look at all the different proxies for when did flat slab subduction start here and what's the record of it. The first proxy that we looked at was magnetism. And the reason that we did that is because where flat slab subduction has been studied in a lot more detail, in South America, as most of you know, there's a, a strong spatial relationship between volcanism and normal subduction, like this area here, the triangles or volcanoes, quaternary volcanoes. But areas of flat slab subduction, there's a distinct lack of volcanism. So the question that we had was, this: when did magnetism stop on this upper plate here, if we have this zone of, of shallow subduction? And so one of the students in our group, Emily Finsell, put together a database. So the important thing here is that this dash line shows the present position of the subduct subducted Yakutak slab at 62 degrees north. Here's that Wrangell volcanic belt. Here's the, the northern extension of the Aleutians. Time is on the y-axis. And this consists of 505 ages from igneous rocks 
in this particular part of Alaska. And you can see that it looks like there hasn't been magnetism in this area of flat slab subduction since about 30 million years. That's an important take home message there. So in, I'll show you this cartoon several times, but the, the Paleocene Oligocene arc that was through here, okay, has shut off by 30 million. That's an important part there. Thermochronology. The question here is, when did this area of flat slab subduction start to be exhumed? And there's been a number of studies working on this issue. There's a new one that just came out in 2013, Phil Armstrong, student from right there in the Chugash. We don't have time to go through all this data. I'm gonna show you data from the STEEP project, which a number of people in here worked on. I'm gonna show you one, this area 1B here and 1A. 1B is this young fold and thrust belt in the subduction zone, and 1B is the backstop. So the 1A data is this blue data. This is Jim Spatila's data. He had this spectacular result where you can actually see the thrust belt deforming. The backstop is what our group was more interested in because we're looking at this longer term exhumation above the area flat slab. And this is Ava Inkelman's data. And you can see there's, in this detrital silicon fission track age, there's this kind of 20 to 25 million year kick. We see that, Jeff Benowitz has shown that in the Eastern Alaska range start deformation starting there at 22 million. So there's lots of data to suggest that there's this kind of 25 million year exhumation event. Now there's younger events within that record, but that's an important point to keep in mind as we move forward. Okay. So what I showed you so far, lack of magnetism since 30 million, exhumation beginning at 25 million in a number of different places on the flat slab. Now I want to look at the sedimentary basin record above the flat slab region. And what's remarkable about this area is that the entire Fort Arc Basin has been exhumed here in what we call the Matanuska Valley. So there's been a number of basins that have been exhumed and the oldest rocks in those basins, so the, I'm sorry, the youngest rocks are Ligocene here. You can see Emily, this is part of her thesis here for scale. And these rocks, we've been mapping them the last two years. They're deformed into a forward and thrust belt. So there's been no deposition above this area of flat slab subduction since the Oligocene. That's like 30 to 20 for you guys that aren't geologists. Um, I wasn't trying to be a smart aleck there, okay. <laughs> and um, so the important message here for the area above the flat slab, lack of magnetism since 30 million, exhumation beginning at 25 million in several areas and these basins being inverted. So these were some of the key points that I just talked about. I'm gonna keep moving pretty quickly here. I wanna talk about the processes around the flat slab perimeter now. So if we go to the northern perimeter, there's a young fold and thrust belt. It's an active fold and thrust belt. We've realized this about the last 12 years. It's this area right through here. It's about 300 kilometers long, about 100 kilometers wide. And there's a beautiful foreland basin section exposed in the thrust sheets here. And so the question was, is this related to flat slab and when did this occur? So this is what the section looks like. You can see a couple people here for scale. It's about two kilometers of section. We've been using a number of different techniques in detrital circon geochronology to document where this occurred, when did it occur, and where did the sediment come from? And, and the bottom line is that it's mainly, mainly Miocene, Pliocene, and that's when we can see sediment coming from the south, from the area of the flat slab by that time. So the, the key point here is that there's this large progradational wedge coming away from the area of flat slab along the northern margin. Let's look at the western perimeter. So we're talking about this area here, which is called the Cook Inlet Basin. Oh, God, sorry about that. And What's amazing about this area to me is that it has 5.7 kilometers of Miocene Pliocene strata. And I just showed you if you cross over into this area on the other side of the area of flat slab subduction, there isn't any Miocene Pliocene strata at all. So this basin floor is just dropping out on the edge of this area of flat slab subduction. And what we think is happening is that as this area is being exhumed and magnetism is shedding off, we had sediment being shed out into the Cook Inlet Basin and also that basin to the north that I told you about. What's nice about the Cook Inlet Basin is that the oil companies have a lot of data from there. And so they've given us a few wells. Chevron has been very generous with that. 
And so we can do subsidence analysis and calculate when did this basin floor start to really drop out. And what we see, I don't want to spend too much time on these curves, on the x-axis you have time here as you can see. The important thing to see here is that where you have these really high slopes here, that's when you had rapid subsidence. And you can see it's this early Miocene, middle Miocene period. So I'm going to move on from there. So in the Cook Inlet Basin, what we see is this large clastic wedge. It's building away from the area of flat slab subduction. And we see this large clastic wedge it's building. And it's mainly Miocene, Pliocene. Let's look at the eastern perimeter. This is called the Wrangell Volcanic Belt. And it's that part of the flat slab that's right along the strike slip dominated part of this system. And this is a really amazing area because there's over three kilometers of volcanic and volcanic clastic rocks there. There are active volcanoes there. And this is mainly Jeff Tropp's work. And I did some work down in the Yukon on this part of the project. But what we were able to show by dating the volcanic rocks, and this is an idea that George Plafker first talked about, but we've been trying to get more data, is that the Wrangell Volcanic Belt youngs from about 20 million here, and you can see the active volcanoes here. So there's this beautiful northwestward march of volcanism that we think is associated with this flat slab subduction. Now, we rely a lot on the work of the geochemists like um, Bill Hart and his students, that, and they say these are adequate compositions, that these are associated with these areas of flat slab um, magmatism. We like to think that the strike slip is a big component of that in opening up basins and allowing volcanism. OK, so let me try to sum up that part of the talk for you. So what I tried to show you, and I apologize I moved so quickly, but that above the area of flat slab subduction, we have exhumation, a lack of magmatism, and sediment being dispersed both to the north and to the west, that we have rapid subsidence in basins during the Miocene and Pliocene away from that area of flat sub subduction. And along this strike slip dominated part of this flat slab area, we have a volcanic field that seems to be getting younger as we move northward. What we still need and what we're trying to do at Purdue, working with Hirsch Gilbert and Lucy Flesch and, and, and their graduate students, is to really link the geophysical and geological data sets together, to really look at, in this area of flash lab subduction, can you go from the mantle all the way up to the surface? I get excited, of course, I love sedimentary rocks, is that you have this rich archive of sedimentary rocks, seven kilometers of Miocene, Pliocene strata. So you can really start to link the deformation that's going on at the surface with what's going on in the subsurface. And we're already trying to do this. We wouldn't have this kind of new model of southern Alaska without the, the bear line, the moose line, uh, Eberhardt Phillips velocity model. But there's still so much more that we can do. And you can see around all these margins of this area of flat slab, there's really great potential geophysical targets. Now what I want to talk about is outreach with native Alaskan communities because as I mentioned, it's a large part of the population in Alaska. We're going to be working in really remote areas. There's over 200 federally recognized native villages in Alaska. We're going to be working out of those villages. And we could have a really big impact on how they look at our science. And so what I want to talk about is some of our, I've worked with native communities extensively probably the last 15 years. And at Purdue, we have one of the largest Native American graduate student populations. At, according to the Sloan Foundation that keeps these numbers. And I just want to tell you some of the things that we've learned from this process that might be helpful as we move forward with the EarthScope Outreach Project. So first I want to give you an idea of what Native American students in general are interested in. I'm going to talk about Leanna Begay here. And she's from Tuba City. And when we're trying to find a project for her, she said, this is what I want to work on. I had all these really what I thought were cool projects in Alaska. She said, sand dunes are migrating throughout the Navajo Reservation. A third of the Navajo Reservation is sand dunes. And with this regional drought, they're starting to migrate all over. Her family raises sheep out here. Houses are being covered. And so we started working on how fast these sand dunes are migrating, different types of vegetation. The important point here is that 
Native students in general want to work on projects that have an impact on their community. And we have to keep that in mind as we move forward with EarthScope. Another student, Daryl Reno, who's working with our group, he's from Acoma Pueblo. Okay, this is the oldest continually lived town in North America. When I was recruiting this student, I, I came here and I said, how can we not be getting more native students in the earth science? He lives on a mesa of the, this is Cretaceous rock. Their houses are built out of stone from these Cretaceous rocks. I walk into their house and their sedimentary structures, you know, for a geologist, this is like, I love this place. But their livelihood is connected directly to the stratigraphy of the Colorado Plateau. I'm close. And so what Darrell decided to work on are these cultural connections he's, between geology and um, Acoma Pueblo. And the same thing happens with undergrad students. And these are high school students I'm working with on from the Kaibab area. And we're, look, the Paiutes are the people of the springs. And if I walk in and say, I want to teach you about faults, they all fall asleep, OK? But if I say, I want to teach you about the distribution of springs, and you look at the villages, they're just these they're, villages are lined up north, south, because they're on these big normal faults that we've all studied on the Colorado Plateau. In Alaska, I'm going to end this in about 30 seconds. Is that good? OK. Um, I don't want to cross, Carl. Um, but in Alaska, we have an opportunity to do this. And what we've done with some of our outreach efforts here is earthquakes. All these students have felt earthquakes, basically. There's earthquakes all the way into the interior of Alaska, this area north of the Denali Fault. They've had 12 six plus magnitude earthquakes the last 100 years. So these students are really interested in earthquakes and the impact on their communities. And so we lead field trips, basically. This is Jeff Tropp, a professor from Bucknell. And we take, this is a trip, we had 40 or 50 high school students from Alaska. We take them out to an active fault zone. This is the Castle Mountain Fault. The students map it, they get their hands on the seismogenic fault. This is the biggest seismic hazard for Alaska. Then to make that connection back to the community, we take them to the West Coast Alaska Tsunami Warning Center. And there are the geophysicists walking through, how do we locate earthquakes on a global scale? How do we just determine the size of a tsunami? And the students love it because it's like they were calling it geophysics CSI, like the TV show, because there's bells going off and they have to go. So I'm out of here. But I hope that uh, these are the two main points and I hope it's useful.